Okay, can you all hear me and see me? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, apologies for the delays, <laughs> by many delays. Uh, so I know that this is the Mathematical Physics Seminar of Prague, um, but uh, I figured it would be fun to, to give a talk on my, my current work, uh, which is in the, uh, in the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior in Konstanz in Germany. Um, because it's kind of cool and interesting and a bit weird uh, and a bit of a change of flavor. Um, I, I will keep the, the level relatively simple um, because this presentation was originally aimed at biologists and, and other people. So uh, you, you'll get a flavor without having to, to know really any details about what's going on. Um, so here, hopefully you will see some videos. Yes. Yes. No, maybe. Uh, I don't know how to mute it. But... Music is not fair. Oh, good. Um, so here you, you can see four different types of animal behavior. We have uh, starlings in the top left. And I apologize on Zoom if you uh, don't have a very nice view of this. Um, but we have starlings, like a murmuration of starlings, so thousands and thousands of birds. Uh, in the top right, we have uh, marching locusts. So this was taken in Kenya a few years ago. Um, Locusts are, uh, they have these particular type. But okay, how do I mute this? No, okay. Is there a mute button? Uh, locusts uh, have these types, uh, these phases during their life cycle, and they uh, have a phase before they start flying where they just march, and it's called the gregarious phase where they're like kind of social. Uh, and you can see that they're kind of just marching, there's thousands of them, millions of them. Uh, and at the bottom right, we have sheep, uh, drone footage of, of sheep moving through paddocks and being herded by farmers. Uh, and then the bottom right is uh, sharks swimming through you know, millions of, of fish, schools of fish. Uh, and the point is that in all of these videos, uh, the motion is, is fluid and there are enough animals that they appear as if they're a continuum. Um, most of the mathematical descriptions of animal behavior describe uh, you know, short, or small groups of animals. Uh, and the entire point is that I'm, the, the project that I'm working on is studying animal behavior in, in the collective, uh, sorry, in the hydrodynamic limit. Excuse me. Okay, so, so this is the motivation. These, these beautiful videos, which maybe don't look so beautiful over Zoom, but I love the quite beautiful if you just look at them on YouTube or something. Um, it, they look like some weird exotic fluid flowing, uh, and the goal is to model this mathematically. Very good. Uh, and maybe some, some motivation for why we care about this. I mean, it's fun, it's a nice project, cool, whatever. Um, uh, as an example, locusts uh, account for, or they, they can influence the, um, the food of 10% of the world's population, right? So being able to control and manipulate the movement of locusts is, I would say, a reasonably important uh, problem to, to solve in science. Uh, Starlings and things, okay, yeah, maybe practically it's not so important, but uh, from a biological perspective, understanding why they behave, um, the mechanisms for, for flocking and things like that, that's the, the underlying biological motivation for this. Okay. So the, the general context of this talk, uh, so it's the intersection of these two, these two circles here, the collective behavior on the right-hand side, which is you know, the, the study of large collection or collections of animals, animal behavior. Uh, and the side is mathematical descriptions of physical phenomena. And uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about the intersection of this, uh, but because this is an introductory talk, I'll, I'll maybe focus a, a lot more on the, the mathematical descriptions part. Very good. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. We'll start with an introduction of fluid mechanics. Uh, then we'll talk about the relationship to animal behavior. And finally, I'll talk about open problems or kind of like what is next in, in my project. Uh, this, this talk was originally aimed at biologists, so uh, anyone who's done fluid mechanics before, which I assume is supposed to be, uh, might be a bit bored, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Okay, so uh, normally when you're talking about animal um, behavior, collective animal behavior, you're talking about flocks of animals, uh, the standard kind of paradigm mathematically is to describe them using agent-based models. So the idea is you have, uh, let's say, n discrete particles located in some box, or something like this. They have some position, uh, which is you know position in space, 
and that depends on time. Uh, and then let's uh, this particular model, the Vichet model, or, or some variation of this, um, assigns each particle a fixed velocity with an angle uh, defining their direction, uh, the direction of their velocity. Uh, and at each time step, the, the angle and the position gets updated according to the following rules. So the idea is that each particle is going to try to align itself with its nearby neighbors. So there's some you know, radius around itself that it kind of looks and it says which direction are, the, are my neighbors traveling. And it tries to you know, find the average of that and then move in that direction. Uh, and then you know, once you've aligned, uh, once you've made that you know, direction correction, then it uh, updates the position based on its force. And you can see on the right hand side a uh, small GIF of precisely a, a simulation using these rules. Um, it, and you can see it behaves pretty much exactly as normal flocks do, uh, as normal birds do. Um, you have like motion, you have polarization, you have um, clumping and flocking, and yeah. Always um, when you're using these agent based models, there's usually some amount of noise involved. Uh, and so that's why they're not um, maybe deterministically like going to a point or something like this. Okay. Uh, so the question then becomes okay, well, what's the hydrodynamic limit? This was uh, in an agent based model. What happens when we, when we let the number of agents, the number of particles go to infinity? Um, so all the microscop microscopic systems we're interested in have discrete individuals uh, which interact with their nearby neighbors and there's some noise involved. Um, so if we increase the number of individuals and we take averages over larger and larger areas, what happens is we get two effects. The first is that the discrete space becomes continuous. And the second is your statistical noise becomes uh, zero, basically due to an averaging effect. And uh, in the infinite particle limit, you get a deterministic continuous system, which uh, is usually differential because, um, well, because we care about how things are changing over time and we want to describe them using differential, using differential equations. Okay, so uh, here's a main comparison of the, the, two type, uh, the two types of models that we have. The, the left-hand side is the current paradigm. Of, uh, of behavioral models, which is just uh, discrete models, you know, agent-based systems. So the particles there are discrete. You have you know, n particles located at position r. Uh, time is discrete. Uh, so it's a, an algorithmic way of computing the, the positions over time. You know, at each time step, you, you calculate the new positions, the new velocities, et cetera. And as a result, the, the equations describing the evolution of this system is uh, a different equation. So here you have the velocity of time at the next time step, time t plus one, is equal to the velocity of the first time, uh, the, the previous time step plus you know whatever it is, plus the rules for the governing the, the motion. So maybe you have some noise there, maybe you have um, some alignment force or something else like this. Uh, and the the key point that I want to make about this is that when the number of particles becomes large, you run into computational issues. Right, because in the you can imagine the previous model where I gave you n, dis, n discrete particles. Uh, what at each time step, each of the particles has to uh, compute a little radius around it, and average all of the velocities of the particles in a radius around it, and then you have to do this for all of the particles. Computationally, this uh, this becomes intractable very quickly. When you are talking, I don't know, thousands or tens of thousands of particles. And this is precisely the situation that we're interested in with these large uh, animal collectives, like the birds, the fish, and sheep, and so on. So on the other hand, we have continuous models. So in this case, uh, you no longer have discrete uh, particles located at individual points, but you have some continuous matter. And there, instead of having particles located, you know, you might have a, a clump of particles in the previous one. Here, you replace it instead with the density, right? You have how many particles are there in a given volume here? So the, the number of particles divided by the volume, that's what your density is. And now you have your density being some continuous. Uh, in addition to that, your time is continuous. So it's no longer at each time step. You have a, a continuous time. And as a result, you have describing the evolution of these systems, partial differential equations, rather than just uh, different equations. Here it's you know the, the rate of change of the velocity of time is equal to I don't know the velocity plus some force causing it to, to do something. Uh, the the main 
conceptual point that I want to talk about here is that uh, unlike the discrete case where you run into computational problems when the number of particles is large, when the number of particles is small in the continuous case, you run into conceptual problems. Right? If your density is one particle per square meter, and like you're you're assuming that you have, I mean, the, the whole point is that the continuous models are only valid when the number of particles approaches infinity, right? When that is a, an accurate assumption. If you have one particle per square meter, then that's clearly not true anymore, right? You're kind of invalidating the, the main assumption of your model. So conceptually, when the number of particles is small, when you have low density, then it's run into some problems. So, so clearly, um, if you're talking about flocks of birds of, let's say, 10 birds, the continuous model is, is not going to be a good model, just because it, it fundamentally doesn't um, satisfy the assumption that the number of particles is very large. So in that case, you want to use the discrete model. On the other hand, if you want to describe 10,000 fish swimming in a tank, the discrete model could do it in principle, but it's con computationally difficult, and that's when you want to use a continuous model. That's the, the motivation there, I would say, for using continuous models. And in fact, that's uh, exactly what we're going to focus on now, the continuous models. Uh, the, this slide is basically uh, fluid mechanics 101, and uh, it was intended for people who are afraid of mathematics. <laughs> uh, and so I have a lot of things, I have the math, which is just the equations describing the, the system. And on the right hand side, I have the words that correspond to the math. So, I mean, I'm sure everyone here is fine with math, so it's, it's not a problem. Um, but uh, yeah, but the point is that in our fluid mechanics 101 lesson right here, um, there are two equations that we're going to use to describe uh, our, our models. The, well, I mean, there are maybe it's best to say, first of all, that there are two quantities of interest. The first is the density rho, and the second is the velocity u. Uh, the, the density is the scalar function of, of space and time, and velocity is the vector function of space and time. Uh, and the, the equations governing the evolution of these quantities are precisely the, the, these two up here. So we have the first one, which is just a, a matter continuity equation. Um, it's, it's kind of the familiar equation if you've done any kind of continuity equation before. It's, uh, it's matter can't be created or destroyed, mass continuity, if you like. Um, and then the second one is, and I've been intentionally vague here, I've written uh, <laughs> the derivative of u, which u is the, the velocity field, uh, over time is stuff. <laughs> and, and the reason I've been intentionally vague will, be, will become clear as, as we move forward. But this is just the Euler equation for the fluid flow. It uh, describes how the fluid changes over time. Uh, and you see here, I've not used the regular derivative here, I've used the material derivative, which is um, the, the appropriate notion of derivative when you have uh, packets of fluid that, that actually also move in addition to properties that change over time. Very good. So these are the, the two equations that describe all of our, um, our continuous models that we're interested in. And the, the thing that we're going to be interested in is the, the stuff, right? This is the real question, the big open problem in this, uh, in this field, which is, I mean, spoiler alert, it's um, <laughs> like, if we can use fluid mechanics to describe the, the evolution of flocks of animals, uh, what is the appropriate differential equation that these flocks satisfy? In other words, what is uh, the form of stuff? Now, that's precisely what we're trying to work out at the moment. Very good. Okay, so moving on. Uh, did I click it? Yes, very good. So to give you a one-dimensional example of a scenario where this occurs, uh, we're going to talk about traffic flow. So traffic is a brilliant uh, example here because on the one hand, um, it, it's a, it's a one-dimensional fluid mechanics problem. That's right. And on the other hand, it's also a model that uh, is obtained by taking a continuous limit of a discrete model or a discrete system. So here um, you can think of uh, cars on a highway as, the, as what we're talking about, but we're not talking about individual cars. We're, we're assuming that we have enough cars that uh, you can describe them as a density, right? So number of cars, let's say, you know, 10 cars per kilometer or something like this. So uh, we're assuming that we have some rho, which is the density of cars, and that that density can, can vary over, over uh, the length of the highway, right? You know, at different points on the highway, the density might be different. And we also have the, uh, the average velocity of cars at a given point. 
And so you can imagine that if you've got like a really, really high density, a really, really low average velocity at a point, that would correspond to maybe a traffic jam or something like this. And the, the system that we're studying then is going to tell us how traffic is flowing on, on any given highway. Okay, so uh, based on the previous, um, the previous slide, we know for a fact that we have the, the continuity equation, the mass continuity equation. And this is just a statement that cars are neither created nor destroyed, which I think is a reasonably safe assumption. Uh, if you assume that they don't blow up or that there's not a car factory or something like this here, uh, then, then we have this equation. Uh, and then the, the second equation, I mean, we have two variables, uh, we have u and we have uh, rho. So ideally we need another equation if we want to solve this. Um, what I could do is I could tell you the Euler equation for, for this system, if I knew what it was. In this case, I don't happen to know what it is. Uh, but I can be smart and clever and work around it, right? All I need is some more information. And what I can do is I can say, okay, well, uh, some very smart people studied traffic flow in the Lincoln Tunnel in New York, and they determined that the average velocity of traffic actually was correlated with the density of traffic, and they found some, some relationship between them that the average uh, velocity is, you know, some log of the inverse of the density with some numbers there. And okay, great. That means it kind of obviates the need for an other equation now, right? Because I can combine this with the, uh, the mass continuity equation and, and essentially solve the, uh, the system, the, the traffic density and the traffic velocity as a function of time and space uh, given some initial conditions. And here I've done this as an example because I know that the velocity now I can solve this, this system. I know it as a function of space and time. Uh, what I've done is I've uh, plotted the traffic density at the end of the tunnel as a function of time. And you can see that you know it has some peaks. Maybe in the morning there's a lot of traffic, maybe in the evening there's a lot of traffic. This is the kind of um, output of, of the, the system of equations that you have that you can solve, you know, if you give it some initial conditions. Very good. So this is a, a great example because A, it's one-dimensional, uh, and B, it's a, a continuous limit of, of what we really know to be a discrete system. So, so that's kind of cool. Right. Yes. Is this uh, I guess it's a kind of equation of state, right? Between velocity and density. Yes. But it's uh, it doesn't look like an equation of state of like physical fluids that would be relate pressure to, to density and so on. Yeah. So I mean you would have to have an interpretation of what you mean by pressure in in some system, right? I'm not claiming that. At the moment, uh, because maybe what I want to say. The fluids that we're going to be talking about don't necessarily have interpretations like this. So you may not have equations of state like that. Well, I mean, that is your equation of state. Sure, sure. Just, just wondering if there's like, you know, an actual like fluid that has a related equation of state. Is there like any fluid that has uh, like cars? I don't know. No. That, that is the eventual goal. Okay. Um, that was yeah, so, so I mean, the goal. Right. The, the goal of, I mean, my interest in this project is to study how animals behave as fluids, work out what type of weird viscous properties, whatever, you know, what type of fluid mechanical properties they have. And then, I don't know, study that as an exotic fluid. Kind of thing. That, that's my eventual goal. This, I, I haven't actually thought through this, it was just a short, a small example. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll have a think about it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so so this is your your introduction to fluid mechanics. Uh, you know, fluid mechanics one one. Um, now you can ask, okay, how is this related to animal behavior? And the answer is, well, we we have an answer, which is that uh, the description of flocks of animals, excuse me, in in suitable regimes is described by two quantities. You have a density, the average flock density, excuse me, and the average flock velocity. Uh, and if these two quantities evolve according to the mass continuity equation, you know, animals aren't created or destroyed, as well as an Euler equation. And the right-hand side of the Euler equation is to be determined. This is the, the main goal of what we're doing is trying to find, okay, um, for a given flock, what is an appropriate right-hand side of this Euler equation that describes the evolution of the world? And so, so this is the, the goal. Um, yeah, uh, I should also mention that this is in suitable regimes. So obviously, as I mentioned before, when you have um, 
when you have a small number of birds or a small number of fish or something like that, this is not going to be an appropriate description. Similarly, um, you have animals that um, behave in different ways at different densities. So even if uh, you have sufficient animals to, to use a continuous limit and to, to actually you know, describe them using velocities and, and average velocities and average densities and things like this, um, it could be that uh, their behavior changes above a certain density, right? Um, a great example of this is the locusts that were in the, the first, one of the first videos. Um, they were marching in this particular uh, scenario, they kind of just marching horizontally in the, in the video. Uh, but when you increase the density of these locusts, they, um, they start um, kind of climbing on the back of each other's heels because their, their density is increasing. And then because of that, they, they start jumping. Right, and they start like, and then you get cascading, um, you know, wave fronts of of locusts jumping, and and the behavior changes drastically once that density is reached. So even if you had a, an accurate description of the marching, there's no guarantee that uh, that it's going to be suitable in in a broad range. Right, we're saying in certain ranging regimes, this is going to be a, an accurate description. Uh, there's some. There's some things in the chat, but maybe I will wait till the end so that because I don't want to, I don't want to break anything. Okay, good. Uh, so the so this is not a new idea, uh, and in fact, this is um, this idea was first studied by Turner and two in around 1998. Um, people have been studying animal behavior using agent-based models for a long time, but Turner and two, uh, as far as I'm aware, were the first to come up with some hydrodynamic model, um, and in fact. This was motivation. The, the motivation for me was coming up with a continuum limit of these agent based models. And that's how I kind of got started on this project. Found the work of Turner and Two, and they basically, um, their, their paper is really good because um, they essentially write down the most generic form of the, the Euler equation, which is compatible with symmetry laws. Um, and so, so they write down uh, an Euler equation where you know, the right hand side. I kept it quite generic here so that I didn't scare people away with derivatives, but it's basically just um, you know uh, derivatives of the, the density and the velocity in, in spatial derivatives up to the second order or something like this. Um, it's a great result, but unfortunately it's, it's extremely general. It is like literally this is the, the most general form of the equation that is compatible with the symmetry laws of nature. And so it's great, but it, it doesn't tell you like there are. Kind of 10 different terms that, that could be there and you know they're probably not going to be there um okay so so can we narrow it down a bit more uh well kind of um there are these people but in was gregoire uh who took one of the uh one of the in uh, agent based models in fact the, the one that i showed you at the start with the, the birds moving in the box um, they took this and they coarse grained uh, this model and they obtained um, a refinement of the Turner and two description, uh, where the, the Verna Euler equation has these four terms in it. Oh, one, two, three, four. Yes. So there's a, a term corresponding to some pressure gradient, there's a local relaxation of the, the velocity, there's some notion of viscosity, there's feedback from the compressibility of flow, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, and the point is that these uh, the coefficients involved in each of these terms are just some phenomenological parameters, um, which may be dependent on on the density. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're just parameters of your model. And this is an entirely theoretical result. So they just took some some agent-based model, they cross trained it, and they, they arrived at some result. Uh, but there's no connection to experiments. And this is kind of the this where we're at at the moment is to determine these phenomenological parameters. And that's kind of where my, my project is, but is coming up to now. Maybe I have a question. Please. Why do you think uh, all these uh, phenomenological uh, quantities uh, have row independence? They, they could have row yeah, independence. Yeah, but I'm not saying that they do. No, no. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, almost certainly as a, as a first um, stab at this, we're going to be looking at constant parameters and seeing if, that, if we can model it correctly using that. Yeah. But uh, a priori, there's nothing which rules out that they could have already. Yeah, very good. Great question. Uh, so now the, the point is 
uh, my project is, is working on connecting this to experiments now. So here you can see uh, some of the data that I'm working with, which is uh, you have some fish in a tank. So I think this tank is uh, about one meter by one meter. Um, and you have these tiny little fish swimming around in it and you're filmed from above with some, some camera. And you can reconstruct the, the XY positions of the, the fish uh, using just some regular tracking software. You throw it into your tracking software, it generates a bunch of XY coordinates at each frame, and then you can uh, analyze that mathematically. You can throw it in um, Mathematica and reconstruct vector fields, reconstruct density histograms, things like that. Uh, so when I was <laughs> when I was giving this talk, uh, a few weeks ago in the group seminar at our institute, this slide was me um, basically asking for people to send me their data. <laughs> because if we want to have any hope of, of extracting phenomenological parameters from this, uh, it's useful to have a lot of clean data. And so as you can imagine, you know, getting videos of fish in the wild is great because that's how fish actually behave. But unfortunately, it's not very clean, right? Like, you know, sometimes there are things in the way, like a coral reef, or uh, maybe the fish get startled by a diver or a shark or something like this. Having uh, lab data that's nice and, and clean, I mean, just the footage itself is quite clean, but also well tracked data is, is important. And that's like things like this where you have um, really good visibility. So, high resolution uh, video, you have high contrast with background. Uh, but even so, even in this, uh, Sometimes uh, it's, it's quite shallow water, so the fish are mostly two dimensional, but occasionally they will swim underneath each other. And then when that happens, you're tracking any kind of uh, tracking software that you have is going to run into problems because it suddenly, it, what was two fish suddenly become one fish. And even if you're able to, to deal with that, you have to then, like if you want to construct trajectories, you have to be able to identify which was the fish before and which was the fish after, like uh, which, which of the fish was which beforehand and after. And that is a, a bit of a problem. So at the moment, most of what I'm doing is just cleaning up data um, that we get from, from tracking software. And yeah, I'm, I'm always on the, the lookout for more data, particularly clean, well-tracked data. So Mark, yes. the, the movie on the left, yes. is that the clean data from the, the fish tank? Mm, uh, it's semi-cleaned data, right? So it's, it's basically the output from the uh, tracking software, which is XY positions, uh, I'm just trying to think at what stage this gift was made. Uh, yeah, so it's basically the XY positions of all the fish, and then you have some smooth density histograms plotted over top of it. So it, it's going to, I mean, the, the dots are the actual positions of the fish, um, modular only crossovers, uh, and then this is kind of some smooth density histogram on top of that. So it's going to give you a, an estimate of, of the density, um, the, the scalar density field. And in fact, that's always what we're looking at, right? Because we don't, we won't ever have an infinite number of fish. And so if we're, I mean, the, the goal is to say, okay, we have a large enough number of fish that we can use continuum, uh, continuum model. And then from that, we want to extract uh, continuous fields. And you're not like, uh, you, there has to be some kind of averaging to obtain that, right? Because, because there are actually not like fish in here. There's no need for number. And so, yeah, always there's some kind of, smoothing and averaging involved. And it's the same with uh, the vector fields here. If you can imagine we're going to have some smooth velocity vector field, uh, if, we're, if we have a relatively simple model, then, then the field is going to be continuous. In particular, if you have one fish that decides to swim the wrong way, this can happen in real life because fish are idiots. Um, <laughs> it's going to screw up the, the velocity vector field, right? Like, because it's not going to be a smooth vector field. You're going to have mostly like this, and then you're going to have one fish going that way. So ideally you want to smooth out little variations and things like that. Okay, uh, so I will play you now a video. Hopefully you can see it. It's uh, just here. If you can't see it, it's on YouTube. It's very simple. Uh, it's drone footage of sheep being herded by a dog. So there's a little dog running around here trying to herd the sheep into uh, a little pen. And this is uh, actually a remarkable paper um, this, this footage is from YouTube and it's really crappy resolution. It's like, 
360 by 360 pixels or something like this. It's, it's shockingly bad resolution. Uh, and what's fascinating is that the people were able to calculate um, scalar vector fields from this, right? So scalar vector fields. Uh, I mean, what I mean by this is they, they can calculate scalar fields based on, on the movement of sheep in this photo. For instance, you can calculate the divergence of the velocity. You can calculate the magnitude of the velocity, the, the vorticity, which is a scalar field in, in two dimensions. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, you can make some progress in, in trying to work out like what the Euler equations could be just by studying these fields and saying, okay, well, if I calculate the, um, if I calculate the divergence of the velocity field, for instance, if this is just a calculation I can do with some video numerical calculation. If it's almost zero, then that tells me that the, the fluid is, uh, is incompressible, right? Uh, it, precisely because if I go back, this term here, which is the feedback from the compressibility of flow, that it's zero, right? So if that term is zero, then you know, the fluid is incompressible. Similarly, if I calculate that divergence of the vector field and it's zero, I know that that term is absent in my, in my model. So there, like, you can make some headway using videos like this and, and simple analyses like this, um, but for more complicated setups and in scenarios where you don't have as much symmetry, uh, we're going to need some heavier machinery. And, and you can also imagine, um, so similarly with the, with the traffic example, we had an equation of state um, giving us a relationship between density and velocity. If we had a similar uh, nice symmetric example of fish swimming around in a, in a tank where there was a similar observation that we could make, then again, you can infer some things. But more generally, we're not going to have things. And so we're going to need some more heavy machinery in the future. And that's precisely what is the, the next goal. This is essentially to use um, machine learning algorithms to, to calculate these phenomenological parameters. Uh, so the idea is to take some experimental data, take it in some machine learning algorithm, uh, some neural networks, and train it on well, train it on a combination of experimental data and simulated data. So we have uh, we have experimental data and we have simulated data from the agent-based models. And then the idea is to then use that to infer the values of the phenomenological parameters of this uh, of this refined Toyota and Shu model. This, the, the, the end goal being able to calculate a, a Euler equation describing the, the flow of animals. Of course, once we have that, then there's going to be refinement. Um, I think maybe I'll go forward. Yeah, so once we have, uh, so we get some observation that informs our models. Once we have the models, we can do simulations using those models and that helps us refine by comparing again to observation, you know, we can refine the models and, and come up with better ones. But certainly as a first step, this is, this is where we're at. Now, I think I'm almost out of time, which is kind of good because we started quite late. Um, so maybe I'll just finish with some interesting questions or some interesting aspects of, of this that, that I quite like. Um, so there's obviously the question of how many animals you need for this to be considered a continuum. And that's a, a good question. There's a, a number called the Knudsen number, which is a hydrodynamic analog of this. Um, so, so it would be nice to have a, an animal analog for this, for this number. Um, so, so that's something that I would like to, to explore and maybe come up with. It shouldn't be too difficult. There should be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable notion of this. Uh, then dimension is, is another interesting, uh, the, the impact of dimension is another interesting question. For instance, all the models that I've looked at so far are two-dimensional models. They're fish swimming, they're either sheep, you know, moving on, a, on land, which, which is kind of implicitly two-dimensional, or they're fish swimming in shallow water. Uh, a lot of the real world flocks that we care about, birds and fish, schools fish, flocks of birds, are in three dimensions, or at least pseudo three-dimensional. Uh, and I say that because uh, they're three-dimensional, but there is a preferred direction, and that's gravity, right? Like gravity gives you a preferred direction. So it is three-dimensional, but it's not isotropic. Uh, so there's a question of what are the differences in two and three-dimensional fluid flocking motion? And that's something I'm super interested in. Obviously, I'm starting with two dimensions and, and going from there because it's easier. Uh, 
Another application of this, or an application of this, is modeling human crowds. Um, so there's a few interesting papers on things like uh, mosh pits and uh, the movement of crowds in um, marathon. Uh, you know, the start of a marathon, they have all these you know tens of thousands of runners basically forming a column, and the, they move them forwards. The the organizers move them forwards at regular intervals, and so there's a lot of study on how these uh, movements occur and um, and things like weight, uh, information propagation through these kind of things. So these are these are kind of interesting and maybe a nice application for this for this work. Uh, I mean, there are also applications then if you think about just the movement of humans through public spaces in general. So metro stations or um, airports and uh, stadiums and things like this. You know, architectural design from from an architectural design perspective. Uh, and finally, there's uh, applications to physics. Uh, so my, my motivation is okay, you know, if you if you get the Euler equation for for a flock of birds and you find it has some strange viscosity properties, how uh, can you then study that as an exotic fluid? And I mean, physicists are interested in exotic fluids all the time, and so it could be that that this happens to be the same as an exotic fluid that physicists like studying but can't study because this thing doesn't exist. But you know, there's a, a flock of birds that behaves exactly like this, so it gives you a nice way of studying. And finally, there's a relationship to quantum mechanics, uh, which is something called the Madeleine transformation um, and quantum hydrodynamics. So this is basically a way of taking the Schrodinger equation and uh, writing it as a fluid mechanical uh, system. So you, I mean, it, it's actually really simple. You just take uh, the you take a polar decomposition of the wave. Uh, function and uh, the Schrodinger equation decomposes into two equations, right? It, I mean, it's a complex equation. It decomposes into two real equations. One is the continuity equation for the, the, the norm of the wave function. So that's your density. Uh, so you get precisely the continuity equation and then you get an Euler equation, like a quantum Euler equation, um, which is Essentially, just like your normal Euler equation with some with your regular potential plus something called the quantum potential, and so that's kind of an interesting way of relating hydrodynamics to to quantum mechanics. It's called quantum hydrodynamics or quantum hydro yeah, dynamics. Uh, and in fact, they they use this people use this to study quantum phenomena uh, in a macroscopic way. So they study. Um, there are like drops of fluid that behave uh, as if they have discrete orbitals and things like this. So yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's a bit tangential, but it's, it's all, I, I'd say it's this kind of the same underlying mathematics, which is the, the mathematics of fluid mechanics. Cool. Okay, so I think I'm done. Maybe this is just the summary is that uh, we're trying to find the right-hand side of the Euler equation for flocks. Um, and this was, again, another one of my calls for data, which is saying I'm looking for data, which is high density, high resolution, and clean and all kinds. OK, so uh, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, yeah. um, thank you, Mark, for, for a very nice talk. The software of the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> it's a very nice uh, approach. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking that if I was giving a talk on this, it would be like Schrodinger's fish or something like this. <laughs> would be nice little talk. Yeah, so, so you need to collect uh, thousands of, of, of individuals. Yes, yeah, exactly. And this is part of the problem that. Um, so when I, when I moved to Germany, the goal was to do some experiments with fish to kind of collect this data myself. Uh, but writing. Uh, it's hard to get ethics approval in Germany for, for animal experiments. Anything with um, uh, with a spine, is, any vertebrates is difficult to get ethics approval for. And we want to put like 10,000 fish in a tank. And so as soon as you say, yeah, I'm going to use 10,000 fish, there's like some red flag that goes up in the ethics committee and it takes ages. Um, but you can do whatever you like for locusts. So <laughs> because they're invertebrates, they don't give a shit. So you can. <laughs> Nice. Okay, any questions? I have a small question. You used some, some special derivatives, capital D. Yes. Uh -huh. So I, I, let, me, let me answer your question by first telling you that I lied a little bit. <laughs> so the, the first lie is that uh, Turner and Shrew, the capital D they wrote down is not exactly the capital D that I mean when I write that capital D. Okay. They use a modified version of that. But what I mean by this is uh, it's a material derivative. So it's, um, if you think about um, 
imagine you're trying to work out the temperature change in, sorry, you're, you're in a swimming pool, which is not moving, um, and you just stand in one place and you have a little thermometer on your body and it measures the temperature change over time. Right? Um, if you stay in the one spot and then the sun slowly heats up the, the swimming pool, then the temperature is going to change. And so just the, the no regular derivative of temperature at a point, like the, the partial derivative, is perfectly good for describing that temperature change. Good. Okay, now, so, so that's great. So it's like uh, that is one, um, one measurement of the, the rate of change of temperature. The uh, other extreme is now imagine you're in a swimming pool where, okay, it's not heated anymore, so there's no sun or something, right? you're inside. Uh, and instead of staying in the same spot, you have one end which is heated and one end which is not. So there's heat flow. Um, the, if I stand still at any given point, the temperature is constant. But if I move, um, then the temperature changes. Right, so it's... Yeah. So you're with this, right? Yeah, yeah. this is. Yeah, so, so uh, you want to... So, so, the material derivative is precisely the the thing which for which counts for the rate of change of temperature, the, the partial derivative, plus the rate of change of temperature due to the fact that the the fluid itself is moving. Um, and I can give you a formula for it, but it's it, yeah, but is, is it just the total derivative? Yeah, it, it, yes, it's the total derivative. Okay. But along the yeah, along the along the movement of the middle. precisely okay. yeah for a given uh, fluid. Packets if the, the total derivative one is. Uh, I lied a little bit. Uh, I, I didn't lie a little bit. That is what it is. <laughs> That's what the period derivative is. The Turner and two uh, thing, which is, if I get back to this equation here, uh, this guy here, uh, it's not quite the, that they have um, additional degrees of freedom that you know. Uh, basically, they write down every combination of terms that uh, could, but er, er, every every very every combination of derivatives of these quantities that you can write down, and they each have different phenomenological parameters. The total derivative occurs when you know one of these parameters is equal to one, but in general, it's, it's a generalization. So. Any questions from Zoom? So I have a, a question. So uh, you're, you're trying to estimate the um, yeah this is the uh, force the force term basically in the fluid equation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, at, at least in the videos that you show, yeah. there's a lot of influence from uh, what you might call boundary conditions. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> At the same time as you estimate the like the force term, mm -hmm. uh, are you also trying to analyze the boundary conditions from obstacles? Um, I'm trying to find data that doesn't have, <laughs> <laughs> but so certainly not the fish with the shark. That's the exactly, yeah, yeah, precisely. This is part of the the problem. Is that ideally I want data that that doesn't have any of this uh, influence in it. Um, and to some extent, yeah, the, the sheep being herded by the dog, the, the fish being attacked by the shark, this is a, a whole like future problem. I mean, this is not something I'm going to even try to, to do now. Um, yeah, it, it, the, the simplest boundary conditions are the ones that I would like to look at, like fish in a circular tank with no, uh, no. With no sharks. <laughs> But I mean, the, the, this runs into experimental complications as well. And this is something that I'm really appreciating working with experimentalists now, because things like, um, you know, turning on a light in the lab changes, like the fish, the fish freak out if, you know, someone next door turns the kettle on or something like this. Like, it's very, there's a lot of sensitivity to, to perturbations that makes doing these kind of experiments really annoying. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so ideally, I want, um, I mean, ideally, what I want to do is we have this amazing hangar, this uh, like a massive hangar uh, in our new building in Constance, 
and it's like you know, 20 meters by 20 meters or something. I want to fill that with water and then throw in a whole bunch of fish and just like have them and it would be like free swimming uh, fish. So there's like you know, no boundary conditions at all until they hit a boundary. Like these phenological models, yeah, from the two and sure, yeah, the next one, did they, uh, did they, did they try uh, finding like what what boundary conditions and agent based models were like, used? Um, do they have some, yeah, that's a realization of the potential boundary conditions? Uh, no, no, that I mean, that's a good question. I think turn two and I'm not sure about this this cross training uh, paper, but turn on to consider basically no boundary conditions. Yeah. So you're in some infinite n dimensional space. Um, yeah, that's uh, even the even the agent based models. There are different boundary conditions that you can have, and that's kind of yeah. I, I think that this hasn't been well studied. The the transition. This transition sounds like you know there's a theoretical gap there. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no. I, 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 maybe I, I should uh, I should definitely say that this is a new area. Like there's literally been two papers written on this, uh, and this is kind of why I'm excited about it because it's a it's a new area of mathematics, uh, or it's a not new area of mathematics. It's not a new area. Of it's a new area of mathematical descriptions of biological phenomena, uh, and people do use um, so people use this outside of blocks and, and things like this as well. Like uh, I think there's some interest in doing this for E. coli cells and things like this, um, kind of microscopic phenomena. I just started a, a project with um, studying the, the movement of worms, like nematode worms, uh, C. elegans they're called. Um, and uh, yeah, these are kind of not quite two-dimensional because they move up and down a bit, but they're like pseudo two-dimensional. So. But uh, certainly, it's not well understood. A lot of this is not well understood. And boundary conditions, I think, uh, is essentially nothing is known. Be another question. Uh, so you mentioned machine learning. Yes. As a step in estimating these uh, parameters. Yes. Now, uh, so the parameters are um, they just uh, like. Is it like a finite dimensional space of parameters? Is it like some functional space of parameters? So yeah, these are so the refinement. I mean, this is one particular course grading of one of the models. So this is like okay, let's suppose we go with this and we say there are five, four phenomenological parameters here, but they in principle are dependent on the density. So it's like function of the density. Yes, in principle. I think uh, as a first approximation, it would be nice to say, okay, can we approximate these using constants? And then if we can do that, um, that I mean, then that gives you a model. And then you can test that model again against the experimental data and see if it's a, an accurate description or not. And if it's not, then you have to modify it again. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, I mean, that sounds like a, a fitting problem. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so are you referring to AI as just like a means of getting, like yes, getting but, this fitting done? Yes, precisely. Because, because what you're fitting is not like, yeah, because, because the data that you have is not the right hand side. Like it's not, um, well, sorry, what are you, you're trying to find the underlying model, right? So you're not really, you're, you're looking for the equation which the thing you have solves. Uh -huh. And yeah, I mean, if you, it, it, it's, it's not just as simple as comparing trajectories, for instance, like this. Uh, or it's like you're not fitting curves. No, but you're fitting, like, you must have a step where like given the parameters, yep. even if they're wrong, yep. right, mm -hmm. you uh, you try to reproduce what you would have seen in the input. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. And then you like then you have the actual input and the reproduced input and then you look at error to see how yep. close you were. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, like if if you 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 have that step, yep. I don't see the need for any AI uh, in in that. I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, no, no, that's a, that's a two, two dimensional bitmap. 
Yep. Is it important to the mission we did not as output? We just compare them and then see how close they are and then feed that error into the so this is not something I've thought too strongly about because uh, it's like the future directions of my project. Um, you're right, I guess. Uh, this slide is essentially based on, sorry, this uh, machine learning suggestion was based on this paper, which I haven't included here because I thought I started it. Um, and it was based on a paper which did basically this, uh, we're using machine learning. Maybe it's overkill. Uh, I'll have to think about it. This is, uh, I mean, I, I want to say that this is the next step, but we're still somewhat, some distance away from this. I mean, at the moment, I'm still in the cleaning up data phase. So it, it, it's going to be a while before I get to this point. So I haven't really thought too much about it. But this is kind of the roadmap is to, is to do this. You try to um, find some some uh, uh, interpretation for uh, those uh, fitting parameters uh, mm -hmm. interpretations in, uh, in terms of psychological, psychological ter terminology or uh, I don't know. yeah um, the problem with animal behavior is that it's very complex. Um, there is some work being done with locusts uh, by the people in, in the same group as me. Um, and they essentially have something similar to this. So you're, you're saying, okay, suppose I, I do this and I get some term for the viscosity. How is that related to the animal behavior? Yeah, this is, um, I, I think it's maybe not as simple as saying this term corresponds to this, whatever. Um, maybe in some simple scenarios, uh, but already we know quite a lot about um, the behavior of the individual animals. For instance, we know that when locusts are marching, um, the majority of their movement is um, motivated, like that there's, from the front and the back. So they want to move forward by like to, fo to follow the, the locusts in front of them, but they're also scared of. Um, of being eaten from behind, right? So they, they tend to bite, they're somewhat uh, cannibalistic. Um, and so that, that's kind of uh, this um, part of the thing which generates this motion. Also, I, I should also maybe mention that, I mean, it's a big important point, but I kind of skipped over it. Um, this is active matter, right? Like this is what distinguishes this from, from regular fluid mechanics. And what makes it much more interesting is that um, you, you don't have energy conservation. Right? Like uh, animals don't, you know, slow down, right? They, they, they generate their own energy. They, they move um, by themselves, they're active matter. And so this, this makes it a much more interesting problem, I think. Um, but to answer your question is, I, I think that such comparisons are probably- If those thermodynamical uh, or terminological uh, constants, yeah. uh, uh, interpretation uh, because what, what I, I think that's a comparison is maybe too simple. Uh, what's the what's the source mm -hmm. of this particular uh, number? Mm -hmm. Let's say yep. you can you can uh, um, change the behavior more precisely. Yeah, yeah, like that. I mean, that requires a thorough understanding of both the model and the animal. Uh, I think that where we're well away from that at the moment. Um, and, and I think that, that having a hope that, you know, the, the pressure gradient term here corresponds to some sociological behavior. I think that that is maybe too simple of a relation. Um, yeah, animal behavior is, is incredibly complex. And by comparison, this is a, a very simple um, model to describe their, their movement. And so when you compare it with uh, uh, human crowd models, yeah, does it uh, have a, any anything in common or any significant uh, uh, similarity? Similarity. Um, yeah, uh, this. I, I mean, as all mathematical models, this encapsulates some amount of the behavior of the thing you're trying to model. 
Right? Mathematical models, by their very nature, can't tell you everything about a particular situation, but they can encapsulate some type of information. Yeah. Um, for instance, you might be able to capture the speed of propagation of information through a crowd. Right? Um, like if someone, if you're you're in a big crowd and someone at the front says the gates are opening, how quickly does that propagate through a human crowd? That that's an interesting question that this model could could go towards answering or, or mm -hmm. understanding. But um, but it can't account for the guy who says I really need a pee and runs off to the side <laughs> and you know goes to the bathroom or something like this. So yeah. Human behavior, animal behavior in general, but the human behavior in particular is, is incredibly complex. And everything we, er, any type of model we have for, for human behavior is going to be at best an approximation and about a small subset of the, the relevant details. But on the other hand, there is a rumor <laughs> which uh, says that uh, crowd of people who are in panic uh, yes. behave uh, pretty the same as uh, the flock. Of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We go to our basic instincts. I mean, there, there are applications of this. I mentioned this to like uh, the design of, of spaces, uh, like you know, airports and, and metro stations and things like this. Like, there's some some study where uh, if you introduce an obstacle in the uh, in the path, it's it counterintuitively improves the flow uh, and like nonsense. Like, like, like that is that's a really counterintuitive result. That this is the kind of um, like. If you had a continuum model, this is something that you could then simulate and, and find, okay, well, um, you know, what happens if we place it in the center? What happens if we place it slightly off center? What if we change the shape of the obstacle? Like how do, how do these things you know, factor into to architectural design? Hmm? Okay. Also, this whole question, uh, you mentioned this Knudsen number. Did you yeah. Know, uh, if I do have a rough estimate how big it will be? Probably depends on the type of animal you're studying. Ah, uh, so the Knudsen number, I, uh, it's been a while since I looked at this, but it's it's um, it's used in active matter and it's something about like uh, the, the length of a path, an unobstructed path relative to the system size or something like this. Oh. And so th there's a rough um, rule of thumb, which is like if it's less than 0.1, you can use it as a uh, continuum system, and if it's not, then it's not very good. Mm -hmm. I think that there's going to be some analog here where it's not going to be exact. It's going to be, okay, like the calculation will be relatively exact. You can calculate this number for any given plot. Yes. And then there will be rules of thumb which say, okay, if it's less than this, you can do it. Or if, if it's less than this for sheep, you can, you can, yes. you can do it. That, that's, I think, because the do you have some estimate of how many individuals you would need for such a simulation? Yes, I have uh, a rule of thumb, which is, uh, and this is based on looking at videos of things and going, okay, yeah, I want at least 100 in, the, in a flock or whatever for, this, for it to be a reasonable number. Maybe it's less, probably it's more. Um, but like this, this video I had with the moving uh, fish, that was 100. And you look at that, and you're like, okay, I can start seeing this as uh, like the the density histograms are relatively smooth at this point. Um, the sheep, uh, I think there's a few hundred sheep. It's kind of hard to, to track them individually in that video, so it's a bit harder. Um, but that, you know, you start getting a reason for this. Certainly, my rule of thumb is at least 100 is uh, what I'm looking for. We want to do 10,000 fish in a tank because uh, I think that'd be great. Yeah, I, I, this video I have, uh, let me go forward, this one right here uh, is 100 fish and it's not terrible. I mean, you, you can look at that and you can get stuff out. Whether or not that's like going to be useful, it's hard to tell. I, I, certainly the more the better, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take whatever I can get at this point. Yeah, and also time scales is another thing. Um, the the locusts, there's thousands, like uh, the locusts marching through the, they have, this is built data from Kenya, um, thousands and thousands marching and they, they do it. But the, the problem with that is, um, is that it's, it's quite inconsistent because at times, you know, you have um, very high density, at times you have low density, like they're, they're kind of, um, 
yeah, they're coming in at different rates. And I mean, if you want to study some simplified model, what you want is, you know, just like a, a consistent, um, you know, density or at least range of densities. But that is, it's genuinely, it, it goes from uh, so, such high density that they start uh, jumping and, and doing their thing, cascading, which is bad because then your, your model goes out completely to such low density that you, know, you have one Lucas walking across and then it's not much use at all. Field data is great because you get huge numbers of animals like the locusts and it's in the natural environment. So it's, it's much more natural. It tells you much more about the, the natural biology of what's going on, but it's not clean at all. It's, it's difficult to track. It's yeah, to actually look good. Okay, cool. Good. So is there any other question? If not, uh, please uh, thank the speaker again. Um, that's recording.